Hey guys, welcome back to Bombay TV. Guys, they're gonna be reacting to explaining the miracle of Quran to a non-Muslim. Guys, let's go straight into this. There are multiple issues that he's yeah. raised, so we have to try to address each one. I, mean, I don't know if we'll get a chance to address yeah, all okay. of them, but at least we have to attempt. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is a correction. Muhammad didn't write the Quran because he didn't know how to write. Yeah. And it wasn't compiled in written form until after. And it was compiled to some extent in his lifetime on parchment, leather, rock, bones of animals. But the primary archiving of the Quran was memorization. Okay, so this is the first thing. The second thing, um, actually what you present as your fundamental intellectual problem, Quran having single source, right, or the inspiration coming to one, and then on top of that it being literal, not uh, inspired, instead of being the inspired word of God, it's the literal word of God. These are actually the things that brought me to my conviction. <laughs> So we're well, looking they at they the, they could be the conviction, but then where where does the original, the where does the original source saying okay this is the okay. source? Now now here's the thing, there there are two parts. One to prove the miracle itself, what makes it miraculous, the fact that it's the literal word of God, we have to show that it's somehow this language is superior to any human document, beyond the shadow of a doubt, to be able to say this is this can't be human word. So let me ask this that question: Why is the Quran then? in your mind, more superior than the Vedas, or the Bhagavad okay. Gita, or the Here's Bible, the or the Gospel, or okay. any other religious document. All right, so like I said in, in my first introduction, I'm, I'm trying to elaborate that point now. I didn't get into that yet. Islamic scholarship is concerned itself with the subject titled The Overpowering Miracle of the Quran for a Millennium and a Half. It has been studied from many, 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 many angles. In more recent history, you alluded to it, there's a discussion of scientific phenomena in the Qur'an that could not have been known at the time and are only now coming to rehash and, uh, uh, and surface. For example, the moon not having light of its own or two different kinds of water in the oceans, you know, heavy water and light water, etc. These kinds of things that are alluded to in the Qur'an that are now only being discovered in science. But this is a recent discussion. This predates, this. you could argue, maybe the last 50, 70 years. But we're, Islam, Muslims are holding on to their creed that the Qur'an is miraculous for a millennium and a half. That's a long time, without any scientific issues, right? The issue is this. In speech, we argue that, that speech is basically comprised, it, it comprises two components, style and content. And great speech is that which has meaningful content, but it's presented in marvelous style, right? What we're arguing in, in the, the linguistic study of Qur'an, and this is what's not easily translated into another language, is because it's the literal word of God, the way, not just what he says, but how he says it makes it miraculous. Now that's very difficult to explain to somebody who doesn't study Arabic, and this makes my job particularly difficult, because I'm trying to say the Qur'an is miraculous in a linguistic sense, right? And so obviously the language that Muslims believe is Arabic. So much so that right now this rendition of the Qur'an, it's cover to cover English. It's a translation of the Qur'an. The title says Qur'an, no Muslim will ever call this Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't call this a Qur'an. You would say this is a, an attempt at the meanings of the Qur'an yes. at the most, right? This is across cultures. Okay, well let me, let me ask you a question on that. So there is a concept in Islam, it seems, that the Qur'an must or should be in Arabic. Yes, and that, because and, it's a literal and that word. A, uh, yeah, it's a literal word of God. But it seems to me that, and that's not believed by Christians, or some Jews believe that about Hebrew, although it, it, it depends. Um, but it seems that, and in terms of if Islam is a universal message, that the language is accidental or incidental. Very so good Christians do not believe that Latin or Greek or even Hebrew are inherently sacred mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. They're merely languages that are sacred because of the purposes Very of good. using them. Very so good. you could have the vernacular language. You could have English. You could have, historically it's Latin, historically it's Greek, historically it's Hebrew, but it's not inherently Hebrew. Okay. But it seems that Hindus do believe inherently Sanskrit is more holy. Yes. Uh, Arabs believe inherently Arabic, like is, Arabic is, is, is more holy. Sure. And then some Jews believe inherently Hebrew is more holy. But if you have a universal message, to me... Guys, before I allow him speak, like, this question has been in my mind. Like, since... 
Like, if it's for all, I feel it shouldn't be subjected to a particular language. But thank God another person has said it. Guys, let's listen to each other. So let's listen. Excellent um, point. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. You, got, you've, you have two parts. The Quran is a message to the Muslims, a message for humanity, and it's a miracle. The message has to be translated in every language. And it actually started happening even in the life of the Prophet himself. The first attempts at a Hebrew translation of the Bible happened by Ibn Abbas, عنهما, a companion of the Prophet, who learned Hebrew just to get, communicate the message to the Jewish community. But the miracle of the Quran is something limited to the Arabic in terms of the language. There are other aspects of the miracle, like the scientific phenomena and, all, and that stuff, that can be translated. But just to give you a taste of what I'm talking about, when I first got into this subject, and I, as I was being raised as a Muslim, I was kind of a skeptic myself. And I heard over and over again that the Qur'an is an incredible language, unsurpassed language. It's the, it's the marvel of, of literature. And my first, I, didn't, I wasn't a student of Arabic at all. And in high school in this country, I just became curious. I started reading the Qur'an for myself. And I found actually that it was confusing literature. It was moving from subject to subject. Tenses were changing. Context was changing. Uh, surahs were changing in, the, in their historical context. There was a lot of shift, and I didn't understand because coming from a Western point of view, you have a certain view of how you critique literature, right? Now, when I got into Arabic studies, and I uh, I, I started diving into this question of what makes the Quran miraculous, I started discovering things that literally they overpowered me, and I'm still a student of them. I actually teach a seminar that's traveling the country called Divine Speech. And the entire intent of the seminar is to expose the literary marvel of the Qur'an to an English-speaking audience without resorting to Arabic. That's, my, that's the seminar. Now, just one example. The Qur'an, Muslims believe, is a spoken word. It's not written. We also believe that Muhammad didn't, know, didn't, didn't have the ability to write. We also know that when he would recite the Qur'an, there would be dozens of followers, and they would immediately memorize what he said, and it would just spread. So there's no editorial process. You can't go back on what you recited. It's gone. It's out there now. You can't take it back. It's kind of like sending an email nowadays, right? Now, one, just as an example, one phrase in the Quran that's part of a large discussion is the phrase "Warabbaka fakabir." In Arabic, it says "Warabbaka fakabir," which means, "And declare the greatness only of your Lord." Now, recall I said something about a fusion of style and content. This, the content is beautiful, and it's part of a passage in which. The, the signs of the Lord have been mentioned, the struggle has been mentioned, and then the messenger is being told, declare the greatness only of your Lord. What's interesting is the phrase, رَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ is a palindrome. In other words, it spells backwards and forwards the same way. So the Qur'an is declaring the greatness of the Lord in a way, in its spelling form, and this is multiple instances in the spoken Qur'an, that it, it's actually a linguistic palindrome. Now, when you want to generate a palindrome in English, like a uh, race car, or Bob, or Dad, or something like that, small one-syllable ones are easy to generate. Maybe a big word is a little harder, but a sentence, it would take you some time to sit down with words that are spelled backwards and forwards and come up with something that... And then even if you do that, your concern isn't your content. What's your concern? The spelling. So the spelling is actually dictating your content. Here you have multiple instances in the Qur'an where this, the content hasn't been altered. The content is continued, it flows with the passage, and yet the spelling structure is, you know, it, it's a palindrome. It's symmetrical, backwards and forwards the same way. And this is not one, these are multiple instances in the Qur'an. And this is one area of the many areas of the linguistic marvel of the Qur'an. The only other thing I want to comment that's easily understandable, uh, actually two things. One, from a historical point of view. Uh, in the 1600s, I, th I believe this was a professor of the Catholic Church, had written a paper about the, uh, the great error in the Qur'an, the great historical error in the Qur'an. And that refers to, you know, the Pharaoh and Moses? Well, Pharaoh in the Qur'an tells one of his ministers, whose name is Haman, okay, he tells him to build him a tower so he may reach the God of Moses and, you know, to discuss with him. Now, this occurs about four or five times in the Qur'an. Haman is mentioned a total of six times in the Qur'an. When Christian and Jewish scholarship came into contact with this passage, the criticism was, first of all, there's no Haman mentioned in the Bible in association with the Pharaoh. Second of all, he, is, he has been mentioned in the book of Esther's under the king Xerxes in the story of the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babylon, the famous story. And this is a thousand years after Moses. So it's a completely different historical era where Haman, and that man, that man Haman has been mentioned as building a tower. 
So the obvious uh, uh, alleged error was that Muhammad Allah, may have confused these stories that he was kind of getting from the Christians and Jews and kind of mixed them together and presented this. And this has been something that's been reiterated in uh, Jewish well, Studies Encyclopedia. And all right, well, let me break in on here. And I am not an expert in this, so it's hard for me to comment on the specific. But that there is an uh, allegation that um, the Quran is bits and pieces of different Gnostic and different other uh, religious literature that was out there at the time. Yeah, there's no evidence to it. And, and the, the coherence of the Quran, the cohesion of it as a text, is, is the ultimate proof to the contrary. But uh, just on that historicity point, uh, Maurice Bocqua, in like, uh, it's about 70 years ago that he engaged in this study. He said, well, Jewish history contradicts what the Quran is saying about Haman and this tower building. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Egyptology. Let's look at Egyptian history. Mm -hmm. Because the French and the Germans at the, early part, the late part of the 1800s had already started translating or, or getting into Egyptian hieroglyphics and re reformulating the language to try to translate some of the ancient Egyptian texts. Egyptology was a big deal in the early 1900s even. So he travels. Uh, to speak to some of these Egyptologists, says to them the Qur'an has this name, Haman, as a minister working for the historical pharaoh at the time of Moses, that specific pharaoh. Egyptologists tell him, and this is actually articulated in his book, The Bible, Qur'an, and Science, um, that there's no way this man could have known that name, and we probably it's not even going to be there because that language, the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, was already dead for a couple of thousand years. Nobody knew that language. Mm -hmm. After translation, he goes to Austria and finds out there's actually a list of people that worked in the, um, the, the, the court of, uh, of Pharaoh. They find Haman as the chief architect. That's actually found in Egyptology, a name mentioned in the Quran. So from the historical point of view, uh, last comment uh, on this issue of the, the miraculous nature of the Quran, the Quran claims, inna nahnu nazalna dhikr. We are the ones who have revealed the ultimate reminder. We meaning? God himself. He speaks of himself in the royal. Okay. And uh, he says, we've made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. We've made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. This is a statement occurred multiple times in the Qur'an. To this day, the only book that, to my knowledge, that is memorized by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people of all ages, despite their language background, in, by the letter, from one end of the book to the other is the Qur'an without photographic memory. I don't have photographic memory. I just started learning Arabic in 2000. I've already memorized half the Qur'an. And this is part-time endeavor. Um, you know, in, in Chicago land, probably you'd find a couple of hundred kids yeah. that have easily memorized the entire Quran. In China, you'll find kids that have memorized, adults that have memorized Quran. So the fact that the Quran says that it's miraculously easy to memorize, a 600-page document, miraculously easy to memorize, and it's memorized by people from all over the world by, to the letter, in and of itself is a miracle. We're gonna hmm. Guys, we'll call the end of the video. I can see this is beautiful. Like, you having this kind of decent conversation with someone is actually an amazing thing. If you read the Quran, based on what I have seen and heard, I feel it's a book that was inspired by God. Yeah, I will say that. And based on the proofs you have given, guys, but I'll still go back to my Bible. And do you know that there's about 2,500 professors in the Bible and more than 2,000 have actually come to pass? And I don't know, I don't know, but I, I'm still going to continue my research. Guys, if you like, just click my channel. I'll see you next time, guys. Please.